Good afternoon, everyone. The March 7th, 2018 meeting of the Thousand Oaks Council on Aging will now come to order. And would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And may we now have a roll call, please. Please stay here present when I call your name. Chair Gorbach? Present. Vice Chair Allen? Present. Commissioner Burt? Present. Commissioner Fotheringham? Here. Commissioner Gitt? Present. Commissioner Gorbach? Here. Commissioner Hege? Here. Commissioner Maria? Here. Commissioner Mortimer? Here. And Commissioner Posta? Here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And we are now on number four on our agenda for public comment. And I have one public comment card at this time from Glennis Bow. Would you like to join us up at the podium, please? I'm Glennis Bow <laughs> from Oak Park. I'm Executive Director of Access TLC Foundation. Access TLC Healthcare is located in Moore Park and it does offer a continuum of care ranging from hospice, home health, skilled nursing, caregivers and transport. With a passion and desire to help the dying and recognise a need to provide additional support above and beyond the scope of the Medicare Hospice Programme. The owners of Access TLC Healthcare founded the Access TLC Foundation in 1996. It's a 501c3. And very generously, the hospice covers much of the running costs and overheads to ensure that the money that the foundation receives via donations or fundraising activities goes directly back to support those in need in the local community. The mission of the foundation is to support low-income and indigent individuals and their families who are receiving end-of-life care. And we do this by a grant giving process. We also educate on hospice and end of life care. Throughout the year, the foundation has supported many individuals, particularly those receiving Gold Coast coverage. Despite the wonderful Medicare hospice program uh, that most of us are entitled to, it does not cover such costs as caregivers or certain supplies or funeral costs. The Foundation grants help alleviate some of the financial strain associated with these additional costs. The Foundation really does make a difference in the lives of the individuals receiving hospice care in this community. We have one large fundraising event a year, a Kentucky Derby Gala. And this year we'll be hosting our sixth annual Kentucky Derby Gala at the Camarillo Ranch on May the 5th of this year, 2018, from 1 until 5 p.m. And tickets are $75 per person aged 21 and over. It's an opportunity for ladies to dress up in their finery and wear, wear their very big Kentucky Derby hats for this fun event. We will be having Southern Cuisine, cocktails, casino tables, and wonderful auction items. We will also be live streaming the Run for the Roses horse race, and guests can place a bet and have the opportunity to win raffle prizes. We will, of course, be using funny money for this uh, all of the gaming. So we would love to have the support of the local community at this event. A third of the grants awarded in the last year were awarded to residents of the Conejo Valley. So please consider supporting the foundation by purchasing tickets and attending this fabulous fundraiser. Tickets are available online at www.accesstlc.com or please call me uh, 805-222-4673. And thank you so much for allowing me this opportunity to tell you about the foundation and the good work that we do. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Ms. Bell. Let's go on now, please, to agenda item number five, agency reports, and I'll ask Commissioner Posta to facilitate, please. Uh, yes, today we have uh, as usual, she's going to tell us about the wonderful happenings at, uh, at the Caneo Senior Volunteer Program. Julie? Thank you, John. We, uh, Caneo Senior Volunteer Program still has the free on um, income tax preparation taking place. And this service is for seniors 60 years of age or older, any income level, or persons with an income of $54,000 or less, regardless of their age. This free service runs through Monday, April 16th. This service is taking place on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays, and we have added Fridays this year, and from 8.30 a.m. until 4 p.m. at Conejo Creek South Community Room. This is thir at 1350 East Jans Road. It is directly across the street from the teen center, so where the AYSO soccer fields are. And also on Wednesdays from 8.30 till 4 p.m. at the Newbury Park Library. There are no appointments taken. It is first come, first served. Also, a uh, breakfast program that we started in November is doing awesome. We would like you to join us today at the Global Cafe. Breakfast is served Monday through Friday from 8.30 until 11 a.m. Everything is under $5. Enjoy delicious blueberry pancakes, breakfast burritos, omelets, or just come and have a cup of coffee and hang with our volunteers. We also have a new volunteer opportunity. Assisted Home Health and Hospice Foundation is one of CSVP's new partner agencies. They have a Hands to Cuddle, Paws to Love program, and they're looking for volunteers to help keep families and pets stay together during times when health-related illness makes this difficult. Responsibilities include walking the dog, assisting in grooming, and cleaning up after the pet. Uh, go ahead and please call the Conejo Senior Volunteer Program at 805-381-2742 if you have any further questions. Thank you. Uh, yes, next, uh, Patty Ham, the director of the uh, Gobel Adult Community Center is here, and she's gonna tell us about all the wonderful things happening over at the center and events to come. Thank you. And um, thank you for having me this afternoon. Um, tomorrow, as soon as tomorrow, March is very busy for us at the Global Center. We have tons of seminars and workshops and events, but tomorrow uh, we have the Health Insurance Counseling Advocacy Program, HICAP, coming to do a presentation on fraud. And they will be talking about how to prevent, detect, and report Medicare and identity fraud for seniors. So that will be tomorrow, Thursday at Goble from 11 to 1230. And you can go ahead and call the center at 381-2744 or just stop by um, the Center for Reservation. I guess tomorrow you can stop by as well if you don't get to that and uh, join us. Uh, Next Sunday, the day after St. Patrick's Day, March 18th from 2 to 3.30, our Goebbels Senior Center Commission Music Comes Alive series prevents Forever Rod, the ultimate tribute to Rod Stewart featuring his greatest hits from the 70s and 80s, from Maggie Pie to Forever Young. Tickets are $5 per person, and you can purchase those at the front desk. Traveling Through Life's Transitions is happening on Monday, March 19th from 4 to 5. Pam Sanborn, uh, one of our uh, local seniors' sisters who lives back east, will be visiting her, and we got so lucky. She will come and share um, her experience of spending six weeks this past fall walking the Camino de Santiago in Spain. Walking over 500 miles, carrying everything she needed on her back, and the life-changing lessons she learned along the way. And she has some wonderful uh, photos, PowerPoint presentation to show the pictures. And you can call the center, 3812744, um, or sign up at the front desk. How to find friends and activities in Thousand Oaks for seniors. 
That will happen on Friday, March 23rd from 2.30 to 4. Join Annette Brosma, MS, as she presents how seniors who are newcomers to the community find the best places to hang out, meet people, and get involved in fun activities. I had approached Annette and, and uh, communicated to her that we were getting a lot of new seniors coming into the center um, that were either their spouse had passed and they were now moving to Thousand Oaks to be near their children or couples who were moving to be close to their family um, uh, didn't know anything about Thousand Oaks all their friends were in another community or another state and they were kind of lost didn't know where to go and what to do and they wanted you know to be social and of course going to global is the best idea they can start there but there's other places in the community for seniors to go as well so um, Annette put this seminar together for me and um, you can call the center uh, to sign up at 3812744 or sign up at the front desk advanced care planning will happen on Thursday March 29th from 11 to 12 Dr. Grosser talks about the need for advanced care directive needed before entering the hospital for critical and life-threatening procedures. He will explain how this difficult time can be made easier for all involved, including patient and family. And uh, I think that's an important thing for us all to remember is, as we age and get older um, that this might potentially happen to us and it's better to um, plan for this than to get hit by it all of a sudden and, and it become a burden to us as well as our family. So I encourage all seniors to come and just find out more information about that. Call the center at 3812744 or sign up at the front desk. And then last, we have learn to use Uber Lyft and other helpful phone apps for seniors. On Friday, March 30th from 2.30 to 4, we have Annette uh, Brosma MS coming back and she's going to share how everything you need is available from your phone these days from transportation, ordering and delivery of groceries, restaurant food and more direct to your front door. Attendees must bring a smartphone and a credit card and will um, be able to load apps and teach them how to use them. And we're going to take everyone on, our, on their first uh, Uber or Lyft ride that day. We will get them in the car so that they experience it with us and they feel safe. And the next time they use it, they will be confident and um, it will be uh, a good experience. So they can go ahead and call the center or uh, at 381-2744 or sign up at the front desk. And that's just a portion of what we have at Global this month. That presentation, uh, I just, it, it reminds me when I was a young and daddy gave me a five cents to go to the penny candy store. And there was so much there, I spent a half an hour trying to decide what to go to. You've done the same thing here. You have so many things to do. Uh, and we have to pick and choose carefully what we have time to go to. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. And I already have my Rod Stewart tickets. I have got to tell you, the, the show last month, The History of Comedy, that was, I think, some of the best entertainment I have seen in years. I mean, it's great. So I thought, oh, my God, right when that show ended, I got my tickets for Rod Stewart. <laughs> and, you know, I, I just love all his music. So li really looking forward to that. And um, the, yeah, the programs you have there are just, um, just the best. Thank you very much for the work you do. And now we're going to go to number six on our agenda, Commissioner Reports, and for that I'm going to ask Vice Chair Allen to facilitate. Thank you, Commissioner Gorbach. Uh, first we'll have uh, item 6A, Emergency Preparedness, and that'll be by Commissioner Gitt. Take it away. Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I want to talk some more about earthquake preparedness. Last month I talked a little bit about it, so this is like part two. We go to the next slide, Francine. So you may recall that uh, in the not too distant future, California real estate or beachfront property will be out near Blythe someplace. And we talked about that a little bit last time. So um, next slide. Um, we talked last time about knowing how to turn off your gas and water and uh, 
the electricity to your house, and now you're all experts on that, so let's go to the next slide. And let's talk about early warning. <clears throat> on February 16th, Mexico City got a substantial warning before the shaking from a distant earthquake arrived. Warnings were broadcast over loudspeakers and from earthquake early warning systems. So you might be surprised that unfortunately California, Oregon, and Washington State still lack such an early warning system. They're kind of common around the world, but not here. Next slide, please. So what an early warning earthquake system will do, will be provide warnings at airports, hospitals, oil refineries, pipelines, schools, and universities, city halls, and libraries, and cell phones. Francine, next slide, please. Um, examples of what this might mean to you, or if you're in a hospital, a surgeon will have time to remove his scalpels and shut off the electric cauterizers before um, he gets shook up. That might be important. School and public areas will provide time to drop and cover under desks and tables. Office buildings will automatically bring elevators to a stop at the closest floor, preventing people from being trapped. Fire stations will open their garage doors, move their equipment outside, and transit systems will bring trains and buses safely to a stop. Those are just some of the things that will happen. So how does an early warning system work? Well, shaking from earthquake travels at the speed of sound through rock. Depending on where the quake is located, warnings of one to two minutes can be sent. Sensors placed at various locations for the West Coast system There'll be eight, their plan is to have 850 sensing, sens, I'm sorry, 850 sensing stations are currently online, <clears throat> but we need about 800 more. And uh, during the current year, funding is available to add another 250 of those. California will reach about 74% of the completion this year of its sensor locations and installations. Oregon and Washington will reach about 54%. <clears throat> the uh, West Coast system um, is going to cost a total of about $38 million for California, Oregon, and Washington. And then it's going to cost about $16 million to fund and maintain each year. Uh, the program is administered by the U.S. Geological Survey. The problem is that uh, the Trump administration has proposed budget, in their proposed budget for the fiscal year, the government year that starts October 1st, they've zeroed out the 13 million dollars in funding that's been requested for the West Coast system. They did the same thing last year and Congress thankfully overrode them. Um, but you know this is a kind of important thing to get this warning. You may not think that one to two minutes is enough time, but uh, I've talked about what it could mean to all of us. If all of us got an alert on our cell phones, we'd at least have time to pull over, get out from under an overpass or off an underpass or whatever if we're driving. So if you have the time and you think that this is important, you ought to con co contact Congressman, Congresswoman Julia Brownlee or Senator Camelia Harris or Senator Dianne Feinstein and let them know that uh, we want the same kind of earthquake warning system that uh, is in place around the world and uh, to please see that this funding gets done. It's an important uh, aspect of earthquake preparedness and helpfulness. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Get. Uh, next, we'll have Commissioner Pasta, and that's item 6B on senior deals. Senior deals. Well, I hope you've taken advantage of, uh, of my previous reports on senior deals for meals and saved a few bucks. Uh, how about deals in entertainment? Well, you know, a lot of amusement parks we have around L.A. here, SeaWorld, well, that's in San Diego, I suppose, Knott's Berry Farm, Disneyland, Universal. All these places really do have uh, senior deals. They change, so you have to call, and some of them are only online. So you uh, should check out the place and check out whether or not they have a senior deal or certain senior discounts and tickets. Many of them, but not all of them do. Movies, people who go to movies. I know you're probably aware that you get a senior discount on your ticket at most every uh, movie uh, theater that we have in the area. But there are some that give you a special discount. For example, Paseo Camarillo, you can go up there on a Tuesday and before 5, and you get a special rate. 
And you also get a special rate on popcorn. I think it's unlimited. So if you like popcorn, go up there to Paseo <laughs> uh, Camarillo. And uh, although it's a little trek, uh, but we go down to the Lemley Theater over in uh, Encino, and they have uh, a special for seniors. Uh, I think it's half price on uh, Wednesdays. And uh, you can get a drink and all the popcorn you want for five bucks. Again, a great deal. You might check it out. You know, National Parks, they have a pass for seniors. I think you could get a lifetime pass for something like uh, $60 or $80. And it's for, for lifetime. Uh, maybe they give us the seniors because they don't think we're going to live that long. But anyways, for the family also. Uh, and it's a really, really good deal. Uh, you check with your museums. Different concerts uh, have senior uh, uh, discounts. Auto shows almost always have discounts for uh, seniors. Air shows out here, I guess, in Oxnard, they have an air show. And how about Santa Anita Park for your racing fans? Uh, they have general admission, season passes, all discounted. Plus, they have special days for seniors that they could come in, either free or half price. Same is true for Del Mar down in uh, Del Mar if you, uh, if you go down to the races down there. How about golf courses? You know, here at uh, Las Robles, uh, our local golf course, you can get a resident card at the Civic Center to identify you, and you get a special discount just for being in uh, TL. And I understand they're changing it so you could go over to Los Robles Golf Course and get the, uh, the uh, ID card, uh, it, which en entitles you to the TL discount. But in addition to that, they have special discounts for seniors and special days where they give additional discounts. You ought to check it out. Westlake Golf Course, the same way. Although they, uh, you're probably aware as a golfer that they do give a special discount on rates for seniors all the time. On special days like Tuesday, they can play all day for the single fee. Again, check it out. Loads of them. Fishing licenses from the state, you could get special discounts. Some sports teams, uh, not too many, unfortunately, and I don't think the Dodgers do it, unfortunately, uh, will give a senior discount. Uh, so check it out. All you have to do is call or get online and, and uh, see if they have those discounts. You know, some of you may remember that comedian, Rodney Dangerfield. He once said that he went into McDonald's, and they wouldn't serve him because he didn't deserve a break today. Some of my friends tell me they don't ask for senior discounts because they don't believe they're entitled to them. I say to them and all seniors, baloney. We are special. We paid our dues for taxes, 50, 60 years worth. We worked hard, fought wars. We are part of the greatest generation that made America great. Keep that in mind. We earned and deserve a break every day of our lives. I'm sure you agree with me. But always remember, you don't ask, you don't get. So remember to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Posta. Next, we'll have uh, item 6C, and that's uh, Commissioner Hagee on fraud. Fraud. <clears throat> that's true, John. We do deserve a break. And there's always somebody willing to take advantage of, of us in that respect. Give us something free. You have to beware. Now, usually I, I cover a couple of scams, but I went, I, I just have collected so many scams, I don't know where to start. Be aware that the most popular scams are still, still being perpetrated on us. The grandmother scheme, the kidnapping scheme, the... You just you go on and on. As a matter of fact, uh, we have a hotline for scams in Thousand Oaks. There are so many scams that are, are going around. Everybody, I think everybody, has probably been scammed. Some of us uh, don't even realize it. But uh, I've been telling you to hang up the phone. That's probably the best way. No, even better way is not even answer it in the first place. If you don't recognize the caller ID... And another way to prevent this uh, from happening to you is 
when you answer the phone, if it's somebody who knows you, you answer with the first or second ring, and they're, they're going to say, hey, Ron, how's it going? If you have a dead air, nobody on the other end, you say, hello, 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 and, and then find, you hear some background noise where they're conversing with each other. Uh, it's probably a robocall. They have computers answering. And uh, the first thing they ask you is, gee, what a nice day. Are you, how are you doing today? Now, how many of your friends start out a conversation like that? I mean, none of mine do. They say, how you doing? Uh, I got a problem. I need some help, whatever. But these people want to act, act as though they know you for uh, your whole life. Grifters, flim-flam men, scammers, cheats, they're everywhere, on your phone and on your computer. And they're making a lot of money. Now, the uh, phone number for our um, hotline for scams, if you got a pencil and paper, you're ready to write it down, it's on the bottom of your screen. And um, while you're looking for your pencil, let's talk about uh, a scam that's uh, relatively new that I just found out because uh, Commissioner, where is he? Postman. That's right, the postman. He's He gave me one on a tax scam. You look at your bank account and all of a sudden you see there's an extra $10,000 in there. Wow, whoa, I made out. How did it get there? Well, you call the bank. You say, well, the IRS deposited for you. You got a refund of $10,000. Well, I haven't even filed my taxes yet. Now, why would somebody put $10,000, $20,000 in your bank account? Because they figure you're going to give it back to them, right? So what happens is the IRS, they file a fake uh, return, and the IRS gives you the refund. Don't spend it, folks. <laughs> the IRS is going to be coming after it. So don't spend it. Call your bank. Tell them something's going on. They'll freeze the account, and they will send it directly back to the IRS so you are not penalized uh, in this manner. There's no free meal here. There's no free money out there. Anything that seems like it's free seems like a great deal. It's probably a scam. You got to be really careful. And all of these scams that were so successful are still being used. The ground. I have your daughter. If you want her back, you'll have to send me $10,000. Well, how do I do that? Well, they'll tell you to go and get a card at the market. They'll tell you to read the number on the front, the number on the back, to them over the phone, and bang, that money's gone. And then your granddaughter calls you. How you doing, Graham? I thought you were kidnapped. Are you okay? No, I'm not kidnapped. I've been here all the time. So they have this, the, um, that's a scam, scam that's been going on for, I, I know of at least three, four years and probably longer. And it, it's very successful. People actually file for that. ARP has a, a special network. And you can go to a lot of these places on the internet and they have a lot of good advice. There's computer pop-ups. That's another scam that's going on. The pop-up ads. And uh, offering you all kinds of free things. And Or they'll tell you your computer is uh, in need of uh, repair. And they will do it for a certain amount of money. Uh, you'll get a free app. And nothing's free, again. What's the money they're getting when they give you a free app? Data. They're data mining. They get data from you. And that data is worth a lot of money, and you're giving it to them for free. So this goes on and on and on, um, that uh, ways in which you, you are cheated and you don't even realize it. You've given up all your data and uh, without, without realizing it. So just be careful and... When it says free, uh, you better very be very, very careful for anything that's offered to you free on your computer or your smartphone. You have to really beware nowadays. Uh, next time I'll try to uh, go over some uh, relatively new scams um, that uh, are coming out. But the way you can do this is just read your paper. 
Call the scam line. Call that hotline number. Find out what the latest scams are. Be aware. Be knowledgeable. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Hagee. Uh, uh, item, the next item is item 6D, and that will be Commissioner Al talking on um, the benefits of water aerobics for seniors. Okay, first slide. Oh, Sarah, thank you. <laughs> okay, uh, I speak from personal, um, strongly with uh, personal bias on this because I've had uh, quite severe arthritis for most of my life, and I can't tell you how much the why has helped me, and especially since I've retired and I've been able to go almost five days a week to a class at the Y. So I'm not going to read the whole every slide. Uh, I have this mostly for your information so that you can refer back to it. But the main things that um, it, even if you're not a, if not just for seniors, but if you have other members of your family that have uh, health or uh, mobility issues, low it's low impact workouts that uh, build your muscle strength and boost your endurance. And that's the most important thing as we age is to have core strength and endurance plus it's a lot of fun the classes I go to five to six days a week all have music and I love music so and our instructors are wonderful uh, and usually your instructor leads you through and you can talk them uh, I to them personally they've all had some type of training and certification uh, no matter whether you go to Gold's Gym or any of the different uh, places that have pools and you can take advantage of this uh, you usually have a warm-up which is very important for any kind of exercise then some kind of cardio or strength building exercises and then a cool down and please don't zip out to change your clothes before everybody gets into the changing room for the cool down because that's very important part of the whole muscle building and and uh, maintenance uh, one of the main things is the buoyancy of the water is very easy on your joints and so like i said it's a good a good choice if you have any kind of chronic pain joint uh, problems or you're recovering from some type of injury your intensity you can uh, next slide yeah the intensity level medium will rev up your heart rate but the water won't jar your joints but you can again the intensity level will depend on you and you might want to start out slow and then you can build up now I think the most important things I want to leave you with is what are the areas that it targets your core most water aerobic classes they include the different kinds of uh, items that are there and they will uh, target your core your arms your legs your glutes um, next slide your back your flexibility that's the main thing that I notice when I can't go to the Y for a while is I get not nearly as flexible as I uh, am uh, when I go to class on a regular basis you also get the advantage of aerobic exercise like when I was younger I used to go to all of the dance exercises after work uh, but now I choose the low impact aerobics that'll get your heart rate up so that you get the advantage of aerobic exercise without jarring again your joints it's also very important for your strength training and again it's a low impact and the next slide uh, it's also a wonderful way to improve your heart health it can lower your blood pressure which I can attest to and I can attest to all of these your and your black your bad LDL and it raises your good HDL and I just had tests a couple weeks ago so I know that's true uh, if you have diabetes it can also and even if you don't it can help you shed extra pounds but it does help uh, from talking to the my other friends at the exercises it does help with their blood sugar levels exercising in water like I said before is great if you have arthritis or problems with your knees or back the main things are it puts less pressure but gives you the same workout benefits you can move your joints I am uh, if um, I have issues with my knees and I can work fine in the I can do any I told my doctor I can do anything in the water but don't ask me to do the same thing on land um, so anyway and like I said it can help you lose weight 
And on the next slide, there's a uh, quote, and I, I give you your sources on the last slide, but this uh, physician says, water aerobics are just about the, are just about perfect. Even though being in a pool seems very relaxing, it is still giving your heart and muscles a great workout. Water exercise can even put you in a better frame of mind. I can also attest to that. Now, I don't want to go, but once I'm there, I'm glad I've been there. Uh, it's also great if you don't like to sweat, but you want a really good workout. Uh, and again, there are classes for every fitness level, and you don't have to worry about keeping up with everybody in the class. You can do your own, move at your own pace. That's the most important thing. Um, one point, if you prefer a fast-paced, heart-pounding workout, uh, even though you're underwater, you because you're underwater, you won't feel that. If you need that adrenaline rush, you just don't feel that, but you are getting those same benefits. So um, you need to know what's best for you. And again, in the last slide, I've given you several sources that you can go and look at and find out more information. But I just really want to encourage you to, if you have any kind of mobility issues, to really, really consider committing yourself to a water workout. It makes a big difference. Thank you. Okay, so now we have item 6E, which will be Commissioner Maria on social service. Thank you, Vice Chair Allen. That's okay. <laughs> Um, I want to cover the mileage reimbursement program that we have here in Ventura County. Uh, Ventura County offers a lot of public transportation for the community as well as for seniors. Um, we have an extensive bus system, there's Dial-A-Ride, there's even Uber and Lyft. But what I want to focus on is a program that's really geared towards seniors that may rely on private transportation through friends, family, or caregivers. Um, they may even drive. but maybe you're not able to drive um, in the evening or maybe you can't drive on freeways. The program's called the Mileage Reimbursement Program for Seniors. It's actually funded by a federal grant through the Ventura County Transportation Commission. Um, the Mileage Reimbursement Program will basically reimburse seniors for in-county and out-of-county driving trips. Now, if you're driving out-of-county, it's medical only. Um, who's eligible to apply if you're 65 years or older? and you're in Ventura County and a resident, you're eligible to apply. Can you still drive and be eligible to apply as a rider? Yes, so for example, like I mentioned before, maybe you drive but you're limited to driving local and you can't go on the freeways or maybe you're limited to daytime only. Um, you can be eligible as a rider for all the other trips. And what types of trips are eligible for reimbursement? If you're in county, it can include medical and or general trips. If you're out of a county, like I mentioned before, it's medical only and it will require verification. The reimbursement rate, it's 35 cents a mile up to 100 miles per month for in-county trips and up to 200 miles per month for medical only out of county trips. And how do you apply for eligibility? It's really easy. There's an interest application that you fill out. The questions are very straightforward. It's one page. And the best way to get the information is to contact the mobili mobility management partners for more information. And you can get a hold of them by their, going to their website, which is www.mobilitymp.org, or you can call them directly at 888-667-7003, or you can email them at info at mobilitymp.org, and they will be uh, more than happy to point you in the right direction and get you the information you need for this great program. Thank you. I just want to say that I've been doing this program for three years for a dear friend of mine. I took her to uh, the uh, program introduction at the Goebel Center about three years ago, and she's had uh, cancer and has to go out to City of Hope for treatments. So for the last three years, I've taken her out every quarterly, every three months to have her checkup and her thing, and uh, we get reimbursed. I get a check for $42 every, so, every time I take her. Plus, she's been able, she has a husband who had a stroke, and... Uh, so she can drive locally, but she doesn't can't drive with the medication she's taking 
on the freeway and, and long distances. So they get uh, help from this mileage reimbursement program for all their local things too. So it's really a wonderful, wonderful program. Oh, okay, so now we will go. Oh, I'm oh. sorry, may I ask a question please, um, Commissioner Maria? Um, do people who want to use this program need to find their own drivers or and or if people are potential drivers and they want to sign up, can they sign up to be a driver with mobility management partners? How, how does no, that work? This, this program is really for uh, an individual that relies on a friend or a family or a caregiver that they already, that they already have um, to yeah. provide the transportation. So it's not a match with, yeah. with a rider and a, and a driver. But if you have one already, it's a reimbursement for mileage. Yeah, what I do is I sign a paper each time authorizing it. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Hi. Uh, I also Mike? have a Mike. <laughs> Sorry. I also have a question. Um, since you're carrying persons uh, for a charge, do you know anything about what the insurance requirements are? Or have you, have, I mean, where does that fall in? Does the agency cover as an additional insured, or how does that work? I, I don't. They do, I don't think they cover it, and Loretta, you may know. Yeah, no, they just are purely a mileage reimbursement program as a, uh, for you, but you work with whoever you're taking to, the insurance is on your own it, that, for taking that person. They're not involved in the insurance aspects of it because they don't match people, they don't do anything like that. Uh, the only reason I mention that is because in some insurance policies, auto insurance especially, there can be a caveat that there could be an exclusion if you're carrying persons for a charge. There's a difference when you carry somebody as a friend and you're taking them, but when you're getting reimbursed, there could be an exclusion. I don't know that, but I'm just mentioning yeah, it's something I, to check out. They asked, yeah, they did ask at the when at the program, and they do have this at the Global Center. They will have, uh, they do presentations at the Global Center, but it really is a, it's not a charge. You don't, you're not really being paid. You're just being reimbursed. They can explain it better than I can, but you're just being reimbursed for the miles. Okay, the next one is, uh, the next one is back to Commissioner Maria for item 6F, and that's Senior of the Year. Thank you. Okay, um, every year, the Commission, for the Council for Aging sponsors a Senior of the Year Award Banquet in June, and this year it's June 7th, 2018 at the Goebel Center. Um, what I want to make everybody aware of is we're, we're looking for nominations. I know there's a lot of great senior uh, volunteers in our community and we want to recognize them. So the deadline for nominations for this year's Senior of the Year is April 1st. And you can get the nomination form if you visit TO. Uh, toaks.org slash seniors you can get the information and go find the nomination form so I encourage you to do that by April 1st thank you okay thank you and now we are on um, number seven on our agenda commissioner comments we'll start to my right do we have any commissioner comments at this end anyone no okay we'll go down this way commissioner comments no? Okay, thank you. That concludes commissioner comments. I'm going to ask um, Commissioner Mortimer now to introduce our guest speaker, which is number eight on our agenda. Hi, I'm introducing Sajel Shaw today. She's Senior Health Services Manager at Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center. She has worked in the healthcare industry for 28 years and currently serves as Los Robles Hospital and Medical Center's Senior Health Services Manager. She is a physical therapist and certified case manager. Her clinical experience spans over a wide range of healthcare settings, including academic medical centers, acute care hospitals, sports medicine facilities, and various areas of geriatric care. Throughout her career, she has been responsible for the management of care transitions to post-acute settings and has managed various Medicare programs. Most recently, Sajol has developed the Senior Health Services Program at Los Robles to integrate care for seniors through the continuum of care. She understands that the road to recovery for any patient does not stop once they are discharged from the hospital 
but rather it continues through post-acute care. As a patient advocate, her focus is to create an environment of collaboration, transparency, and accountability for a patient-centric health care delivery. Please welcome Sejal Shaw. Thank you very much. Pardon, I'm vertically challenged, so <laughs> I have to adjust there. <laughs> um, do I have the yeah. presentation there? Okay. I switch, or are you? I have the control? There, okay, perfect. So um, this is an honor to be here. Um, council members and friends in the room and uh, folks tuning in from the comfort of your home. Uh, this is a very dear subject to me personally uh, with my aging parents, my dad passed now, but I have gone through the journey with them um, not knowing, although I was in a healthcare field for all these years, not really knowing where to, uh, what kind of questions to ask, what are, what are those caveats to uh, navigate through. So as we saw that earlier, we, we were talking about the emergency preparedness, right? Um, we have emergency preparedness for life disrupting events all the time. It could be earthquake or it could be mass uh, casualties or school shooting or all kinds of drills we grew up with. Some of you might have grown up with those nuclear attack drills. I was just recently, I was talking to one of our family friends and he was telling, he's in his 70s, and he was telling my 14-year-old that they had to do that kind of drill too back in the days. So we prepare our community for something that disrupts the life in a very um, big, impactful way. What do we do as a society, as a community, and as an individual to inevitable aging and end of life? and what that brings to our, our life. So that's where this whole topic of navigating the healthcare to the continuum comes in. And it's not just the hospitals, it's also beyond the hospital walls as we go. We heard the word uh, care continuum. Um, what is it really? Care continuum means what? Um, so care continuum is integrating the care throughout the process. So it could be in a post-acute hospi hosp hospice environment, or it could be in a broader uh, aspect of acute care into the next level, to the next level, back into the community, to back where we were um, before we got sick, any patient. So that could be, and why do we need, need to really talk about it? Just imagine if you have um, a patient who goes from one provider to the next, from paramedics to the emergency room, to a doctor, to the specialist, to a nurse, to a home health, a skilled nursing facility, all over in a horizontal line. You have a line like that, and a patient keeps moving from one stop to another. Many of the time, the first person and the last person have no connection. And here's this patient moving from point A to B to C to D and on and on. When we integrate the care, the care continuum, it becomes a circle. That horizontal line becomes a circle. So everybody has a visibility with the patient in the middle of it. That's the care continuum. In recent years, healthcare is moving towards that value-based healthcare. You might hear a lot about that, or a patient-centric care model versus payer-centric care model. So in a health healthcare, Who's paying for the care is secondary. What care is delivered is more important. However, we all have been in front of that um, age-old dilemma, right? Where what's your insurance? What's the coverage? Versus what's the care? So that's and everybody's paying by the same payer. Is the care same? That's the question. So we just, I want to focus this talk obviously on the seniors, and as we know that there are about 58.5 million Medicare beneficiaries counted in 2017. So that's a lot of seniors uh, in the community nationwide. Um, part of the aging 
takes us to those chronic illness, right? 65 years and older, statistically speaking, 80% of them have at least one chronic illness, and 68% have at least two chronic illness. What are those chronic illnesses are? Something that, um, so those chronic disease are something that progressively gets worse, right? And it could be diabetes, it could be high blood pressure, it could be arthritis, it could be uh, heart failure, COPD, but there is, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a chronic in nature by, by definition. So if we just look at how, um, how as a human being, we existed and how we ceased to exist, right? The, the aging and the, the end of life conversation. About a century ago, how did we all die? Dying is not oh, new. Aging is not new. What's new in the medical field is all the research and all the life prolonging measures and, and all the good medications and technology that has come. So about 100 years ago, the death was typically what, sudden? right, through accident, childbirth, infection, something like that. Uh, in recent years, in most economical, uh, economically developed society, most of the people die slowly with chronic disease. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Depends which way we take it, right? Is earthquake a bad thing or a good thing? Depends how prepared we are. So it's just, just taking that context, especially living in California, we might be able to relate to that. I don't want to say that aging and dying is uh, disastrous like earthquake, but it just puts it in the perspective. So uh, just navigating and being prepared. That's the point I'm trying to drive here is being prepared. Uh, earlier we heard that advanced care planning and, and post and just, just having those conversation with your providers, with yourself, with your family, is very, very crucial. If there is a time when there is um, the physical and mental capacity is not there to convey those wishes and goals of care, do we have a plan? Just like how we were talking about the other plans. Um, talking about the quality of life versus quantity of life. There is no right way or wrong way. The point here is knowing what is meaningful to individual and knowing about it and talking about it. So I'm going to take um, this very sensitive touch uh, subject, end of life. Who wants to talk about it? Nobody, right? If I ask anybody that who wants to die peacefully with no suffering, suddenly, I mean, I would like to sign up for that if I find that sign up sheet somewhere, honestly. Statistically speaking, less than 10% of the population dies that way, even now. So if there was a less than 10%, I mean, I would love to be part of that statistic. How about those 90%? That's not part of that graph there. So that's where majority of us fall in, and it's better to be prepared for that. So if we took, we were talking about the chronic illnesses, right? What is the trajectory of that end of life? It's a slow decline. Does that mean sudden? Not really all the time. It could be, uh, it's measured in the functional level, right? How the life, just a few days back, my 14 year old was walking so fast, I could not keep up. And I, it just, it just occurred to me that, wait a minute, you know, there is a change that just inevitably happens. And we have to embrace that and be prepared for that. So with the pro uh, chronic uh, illnesses, progressive chronic illnesses, uh, especially the dementia and the frailty, um, the end of life happens slowly. It just kind of slowly windles down, right? Looking at this graph where we have organ and system failure, this is a very, t very um, unique graph with the patients with heart failure, with the COPD end stage and all that. It's not a sudden death or end of life. It you, it's manages, then there is exacerbation, goes down, you get a little bit better, then it manages, goes down, and slowly it declines, right? So that's, uh, that's the trajectory of those uh, organ uh, system failures that overs happens over the years. It's not sudden. So 
Now that we got that end of life out of the way, what do we do before that? And that's, that's the million dollar um, topic we have here. Um, the care continuum that we talked about, what does that include? It's the acute phase of illness where you require the hospital or sometime urgent care. Um, then there is that recovery happening beyond the hospital walls into the post-acute arena. And then integrating back into the community to the best of um, anybody's ability to going back to whatever functional level as best as you can. So just let's just take one um, setting at a time and we'll try to go into a detail plan so you understand that whole journey and what it takes, where the decisions are made, what are the options through that journey. That's the, that's the goal here. So acute hospital, at Los Robles Hospital, we, we have this amazing full functioning ER department. But before ER also happens the paramedics, right? So I, I did not mention it here, but I would like to emphasize that certain um, illnesses are better transported through paramedics, such as stroke, heart attack. Going to the ER in the back of your loved one's seat, a car, a car back seat is not a very good idea. Because when you call 911 and the paramedics are dispatched, there is that established communication between the ER and the paramedics. The ER is getting ready for that. So many of the time, if we talk to any of our paramedics or ER physicians, they will emphasize over and over again. If there is a heart attack, there is a stroke, there is that kind of life-threatening emergencies, rather than putting your loved one in the car, wait for the ER. Uh, we have these wonderful paramedics in this county, so and they work very closely with us. We have some of the doctors who have also trained them on what to expect when to come to the ER bay. So once you're in ER, if um, we have the um, physicians, the ER physicians are there. Um, a term that is uh, new in recent years is hospitalist. So those are the physicians. A lot of people, uh, I personally did not grow up with that term, but in the last 10, 15 years of my medical career, I have started uh, uh, to work with them. These are the physicians who are dedicated to see the patients in the hospital setting. Back in the days, and it still happens in some, you know, many of the doctors, primary care doctors, follow their patients in the hospital setting, but they are not there 24-7. Some of them have solo practice, some of them have group practice. Some of them have coverage, some of them don't. So these hospitalists are that central role that plays um, in care, coordinating that care within the hospital setting. And then they do, they're always in touch with the primary care doctors. So how do we, um, now the hospital stays over and this is care transition, the discharge process through the hospital is a very crucial time. Uh, statistically, there are a lot of um, mishap that can happen if that discharge is not done solidly. If the right care is not delivered at the right time in the right setting, it, the trajectory is quite different too. So just looking at some numbers, um, in 2016, there were 36.5 million hospital discharges in the United States. That's a lot of hospital discharges for about 3,000 or so hospitals nationwide. Out of those um, uh, patients, the Medicare patient, the fee for service, when I say fee for service, those are the Medicare straight benefit, uh, not the HMO model, the, the direct medical or original Medicare or medical fee for service we are talking. About 42% of those receive some sort of care after the hospital discharge, the post-acute care as we say it. So many of the time in the hospital, we come across families and patients who are not quite sure why, how that decision was made of discharging or keeping the patient. Sometimes we do come across patients who are saying, get me out of here now and we call them that AMA, um, Against Medical Advice. So if you're medically stable, it's not a good idea to just uh, check out like that. And uh, we also have other spectrum sometime where it's time to be discharged to the next level, 
and we are just loving Los Robles so much that <laughs> don't want to go anywhere. So I just want to emphasize a little bit there that what are the factors that goes into the decision making process of that discharge? You know, there are, there are guidelines um, why a patient needs to continue to be in the hospital. So that is um, a presence of acute care condition that requires any continuous therapeutic intervention or very close careful monitoring. Sometimes those telemetry units and the heart condition needs to be monitored. Or there are some um, uh, example for therapeutic intervention is certain IV antibiotic or some certain um, um, treatments that can only be delivered in the hospital setting. So that's, that's the requirement. And occasionally there are times when there is no safe discharge site. Patients just don't have enough support. Um, and we are not able to discharge in a safe uh, discharge site. Um, who makes that decision of discharge um, or not discharge? It's a medical decision. It's really not a choice. So it, it's, there's a lot goes on in terms of the lab and the physician and therapeutics and you know, what are the other diseases there. And just there's a lot of things that goes into that medical decision. It's not an individual choice. Um, the goal here is to go to the next level of care, which is least restrictive, cost efficient, and it's a safe site. That's, that's the bottom line. So um, from hospital, this, you know, where do we go next? Um, there are a lot of um, options there, right? That care, as we talked about it, continues in the, in the other post-acute care settings. How do we decide what is the right care? at the next level. What are the options there? So here we can see that a uh, patient can go home with home health or without home health. Skilled nursing facilities, and when I say skilled nursing facility, I don't mean uh, nursing homes in a long-term stay custodial setting. We're talking about a short-term rehab, uh, which is kind of a stop between before going home. And then acute care rehab hospital. At Los Robles Hospital, we have um, we, what we call East Campus. You might have heard about it. It's a rehab hospital. Uh, it's a whole different care setting than skilled nursing facility. And then uh, lastly, at the bottom, you see long-term acute care hospital with LTAC in many times. You might hear that acronym. It's also a hospital level intensity into the long-term care uh, setting. So let's just look at all those options one at a time in, uh, in detail. Going home with home health, um, this m out of those post-acute um, care setting, half of them goes home with home health. That's a pretty impressive care setting in my opinion because it's a least restrictive. Who doesn't want to be home, right? And your care continues in the comfort of your home with a home health agency. It's cost effective, of course. Um, however, it's not always um, uh, the option. So for the home health, um, the agencies are regulated by um, Department of Health. There are criteria. What they can offer in the home setting is physical therapy, occupational therapy, uh, IV antibiotic, wound care, infusion. Um, and because of all that, doctor's orders are required. So it's a, it's a medical model, not a social model. Uh, when do the hospital or home health needs to start? Medicare has a very strict guideline for that. The home health has to start within 24 to 48 hours. So you get home uh, discharged from hospital, and your home health agency, uh, for whatever reason, has not been able to come and start the care for three days. That's not a good plan. So it's it's accountability and transparency, as we were talking about. Do the do the patients and the community know when they're supposed to be arriving? When the home health is ready to arrive. Are we willing to open our doors? You know, we hear those stories too that they're like, I just got back from hospital, leave me alone for a few days. We get those calls from home health agencies too. And that's the reason it's referred because you need that medical care. So we need to allow them to take care of you. Um, 
and then uh, the other point that I didn't mention, forgot, was follow up with a primary care spe or specialist. After statistics, after statistics prove that, that when you get discharged from hospital, if you see your primary care doctor in the community or your specialist, within one to two weeks, your chances of readmitting are less because the care that was um, paused at the hospital the doctor's able to again reconcile and see if everything is going uh, as planned or not. So how do we know that which agency is the right agency for me, right? That's a million dollar question too. In recent year, Medicare, um, Central for um, Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, have made a lots of quality data from all these agencies. It made it public. Right for all the uh, the right reasons, so that there is a public knowledge of who's providing what and what you should really look for in that agency. Patients and family have the choice of choosing the home health agency. I would say, do your homework and and, and use it because it's there for a reason. Uh, how do you compare one agency A versus agency B? You know, they all get paid the same way. They all have more or less the same. Um, services, just like in the hospital most of the time. So how do we know which one is a better choice for individual? Medicare.gov, uh, if you just Google home health compare Medicare, this website will come up and it can let you compare their health inspection records, their uh, star rating, all the details that you need to know about their home health agency. And you can always compare. So use that choice. Our case management um, and department have the choice list. Upon your discharge, you'll be given that choice list. Uh, again, ask questions to the case manager, to the doctor, that you know who will meet my need in the community. Our Los Robles website has a very good page, senior care page. I, I invite you all to explore that, and we have a home health choice list on that too. So um, again, as I said, just go, you know, um, see the doctor within seven days, whether you have home health or not. When you go home, it's very important. And then there is this uh, going home without the home health. Uh, if there is any need for caregiving, just for bathing, dressing, basic needs, there the private duty caregivers are available. Medicare doesn't pay for that. So you might want to do your homework in terms of hiring that help if needed. A lot of the quality home health uh, caregiver agencies have special programs where it's a flat fee for the first few days. So if you're in a hospital, had a total hip replacement, for example, somebody needs to go home and get the food in the fridge, get the dog uh, who was whatever. You know, if, you, if there was a 911 call and the whole house was left in disarray, somebody can go and fix that. Um, they can give you the ride, they can help you in the first few days. There is sometimes flat fee or hourly rate, so check that out. Community resource, this community is very blessed with that. I have to tell you that I have worked in many other communities in Southern California and also in other states in, um, in, uh, in the United States. Conejo Valley, I, I'm very impressed, really. So uh, we have Senior Concern and we have other um, uh, Global Center. We have just a lot of resources, a lot of aware seniors in the community. Use it. Um, my goal at Los Robles also, I have tried to bring that resource within the hospital because many of the time, a lot of our families are not aware and then there is this medical event that kind of throws them into, the, especially the, the grown-up children that they have never heard of these resources. They're out of state. They're just not aware that what's out here for mom and dad. So I, I have tried to bring that together too for them. So assisted living facility, that's also part of the home, uh, going home, right? It's not a medical model. It's not regulated by the Department of Health. It's regulated by social service uh, department. Uh, it's non-medical. It's usually private pay or some long-term insurance will pay for it. Um, again, there are lots of options. There are a lot of options within the community too. I would say just do your, um, do your homework. Our case management department at the hospital can also give the list of those in the area. 
So skilled nursing facility, this is a very, um, um, this is the most complex option sometime, although it looks very simple, right? Because it's going to skilled nursing facility seems like, okay, I'm going to nursing hall, right? I'll get my rehab, go home. Um, there are a lot of factors that affects that decision too. So uh, a lot of our folks don't want to go to nursing home. They would say, point out to us. And I cannot emphasize enough that skilled nursing facility is there for rehabilitation need for short term at a low intensity. So it's a, is on the left it says short term rehab. Now if the short term rehab turns into a long term need, most of the skilled nursing have custodial bed that can be utilized as a private pay. So how do we know what, how do you qualify for short term rehab? Uh, again, it's a medical model, so requires certain criteria. F Medicare fee for service have a very specific guideline on how we get qualified. A qualifying event has to happen as per CMS and Medicare guideline. So qualifying event is a three night in a hospital stay. And why is that? It's, it's one of those um, um, rule that has deep meaning but it's also in the way sometime. So qualifying event for three night, CMS tries to prove that you're sick enough to stay in the hospital for three days. Now you need help at the next care setting. So if you were not admitted and just under the observation for one night, skill nursing benefit does not kick in. So that's the qualifying event. Most of the skill nursing facility uh, have a very good rehab program, and that uh, requires that the patient has to participate at least one hour for five days minimum. That's also a requirement. And then um, if the patient have other insurances, this requirement changes. So this is mainly for fee-for-service population. So who pays for it? That's the question, right? It's a very, um, very important question. Medicare benefits are uh, as simple as they are. They can also be complicated if it's not understood well. So there are 100 days under skill um, setting that every patient per benefit period, there are 100 days are allocated. All those 100 days are not fully covered by Medicare. So the first 20 days are fully cover for the benefit period. Then after 20 days, up to 100 days, there's a co-payment of $164.50 per day per benefit period, unless you have a long-term policy which might pick it up or a secondary insurance. Um, and then after 100 days, there is no coverage, right? So many of the time in hospital, we'd also um, hear this term from our patient that I have 100 days. I would caution everybody that do not take that 100 days because the way it works is per benefit period. So one benefit period have 100 days. Now after the 100, uh, uh, one benefit period, between two, say let's this put it this way, between two benefit period, patient has to be well, not hospitalized for 60 days. Now we looked at that chronic illness, right, and trajectory. So if you have any of those, 60 days sometimes is a long time to stay completely out of the hospital. There might be a readmission. So if there was um, a skilled day all used up, lo and behold, before 60 days, if you get sick, there are no Medicare days left. So that's, that's a problem. So only use as you need to. Um, and then within the 30 days, if there are, um, if there is a break in the skill, um, then the new benefit period starts. So you, you're in hospital, say, for five days. You go to a skilled nursing facility. You're there for 20 days. Now you go home, and then within 30 days, if you get sick, you can still use those 100 days. But if after 30 days, a new benefit period kicks in. So you need another three days of qualifying hospital stay. So as I said, it sounds very simple, right? I want to go to skilled nursing. I have the benefit. There are some caveats to that, and it's very, um, our case management can also explain that. So how do we, again, uh, select 
what is the right skilled nursing facility. They all get paid same way. They all have more or less the same services. How do we know which one is the right one for me? Most of the skilled facilities, um, I'll take it back. Skilled facilities are um, rated the same way as a home health agencies by Medicare. So they're a star rating. Again, going back to that home health uh, guideline, Medicare have made all the data available for each and every home health agency in the area. I mean, skilled nursing, sorry. Um, you can go on the Medicare skilled nursing compare website and you can see their health inspection, where was the penalty, where was the good staffing, what are their overall quality rating, everything is out there. You know, just, just understand that what are the options. Many of the time scale nursing facility within the neighborhood might be different than what's out there 10 mile away from here. Again, knowing your goals of care will help you make that decision. Um, patient has the choice but the choice is dependent on the bed availability. So I might say I want sniff A, and the, they don't have the bed for next three weeks, then we have to go to the choice B. That's how it works. And the custodial care, we already covered it, that if, if the care continues to be um, needing in terms of dressing, bathing, all that, then um, there are custodial bed available in a different care settings. Um, so we are going to the acute care rehab hospital uh, setting. That's another care setting. Earlier we saw in the care continuum discharge options. We have the home health, we have the skilled nursing facility, we had, and then acute rehab hospital. On East Campus here, Los Robles, we have a dedicated acute rehab hospital. Sometimes it's also called ARF, inpatient rehab facility, or ARU, acute rehab unit. It's part of the, um, it's a hospital setting, and that's why it requires a very strict guideline and the criteria. The, the difference between skilled nursing and acute rehab is this option is intense and a short stay. So minimum requirement is three hours of therapy, right? So if the patient is not strong enough to tolerate the three hours, then Skilled nursing is a better option for them. Uh, physician monitoring is needed. And again, it's mainly for complex nursing services, intense rehab, and a physician has to see them minimum three times a week. So there are very, as you can see, there are various uh, qualifying criteria. Um, there are qualifying diagnoses too. So just this is a screenshot of how it compares acute rehab hospital versus skilled nursing. Uh, acute rehab is more intense. Skilled nursing is a little bit um, less intense in terms of um, the rehab uh, needed. Pre-admission screen is needed as per Medicare guideline for acute rehab. Skilled nursing does not require that. Um, for acute rehab, it's a complex level of care with multidisciplinary coordinator team approach versus skilled nursing is a basic level of care. And then the diagnosis specific. Which care setting is right for you depends on what medical diagnosis we have and what's the condition of the patient. Uh, one thing that I would like to emphasize here is, is these are two different care settings as we say it in the hospital. These are not, we don't have choice over which one I want to go to. I want to go to East Campus or I want to go to a skilled nursing. That's a medical decision. So this is the last but not least. I want to talk about the readmissions. And um, what is a readmission? For especially for elderly, 65 and over, uh, especially with the chronic illness, readmission can be a real um, reality. Statistically, Medicare terms, readmission is when you have to go back to the hospital within 30 days, that's a typical readmission. Are they all avoidable? A lot of them are. Are they, some of them are not avoidable either. So how do we really sort it out? Statistics also points out that every time you go to the hospital and get admitted, the mortality rate and the, you know, the overall health and well-being goes down for elderly. So how do we avoid that U-turn as we say it, right? So among the Medicare patients, about 17%. So that's almost one in five 
elderly get readmitted within 30 days. So that's, um, that's something that we are very closely monitoring at the hospitals. We want to make sure that once hospital stays over, patients are staying healthy and safe in the community and not another event happens right away that drags the overall trajectory down. What are the common readmitting diagnoses? Heart failure, COPD, pneumonia, infection, sepsis. Those are the top. Heart failure, COPD, and a lot of those, um, especially those two, are, we call it disease management in medical world, but also it's a lifestyle management. I can, you know, their medication, diet, physician follow-up, certain, following certain health rules will also help you just to stay out of the hospital. And what really influences that readmission, like what do we need to do so we can reduce the readmission? Care transition, as I said earlier, sending the patient from hospital to the next level, receiving right care at the right time in the right setting. That number shows that that care transition done well reduces the, the readmission rate. And then the next care setting, what is the quality there? Right? That, that affects that readmission too. You are sent to the, the next level of care, but if the care is not delivered in the right way, in the quality way, that adverse event can happen again and that U-turn can come. So we also at Los Robles Hospital, we spend a lot of our energy, a lot of, a big portion of my work goes to monitor that too and work with those post acute providers to make them, you know, just engage them, collaborate with them so that we both are on the same page so the patients don't make that U-turn and come back to us. Um, again, as I said, this is process. That's understanding that, and that's where, that's where um, the patient engagement comes in. We try to educate our community, and this is part of my, my job too, to uh, just engage the community and all the providers. So we are all singing the same song. So there, there are um, post acute providers um, in recent years have come up with special programs to reduce the readmission rate. Talk about that. As an informed consumer, you might want to just, it sounds very intimidating when we talk readmission and post-acute and you know all those medical jargons, but you can always ask those questions. If you go on that Medicare website to compare the skilled nursing facility, the home health agencies, those rates are posted there too. Now, of course, those data is a little bit lag because that data takes a while for the Medicare to reconcile and post it on the site. But you can always engage in that conversation with the provider. So that being said, uh, it's a whole uh, continuum of care from acute all the way back into the community. And if things don't go well, what happens again? So any question? Yes. Yeah, uh, a, a question and a couple of points. Um, you mentioned in the first third of your uh, uh, you know presentation the AMA. You know some of these people who scream to get out of the hospital mm -hmm. against medical advice. Um, in your experience, can that affect the possibility of insurance coverage for their hospital stay? Meaning, if they are leaving and they incur additional problems because it's against medical advice, is it possible that that could uh, exclude them from getting covered? It depends on the insurance. Mostly for elderly, for Medicare, it's not a problem. Okay. But for commercial, yes, sometimes. It's for younger population, sometimes, but usually not. Okay. Usually not. Uh, another point, um, when you were talking about the facilities, uh, where you can get information is uh, like long-term services of Ventura County. There's an agency, the Ombudsman Agency. Correct. And they cover all of the skilled nursing residential care facilities, and you can call. I happen to be an Ombudsman, mm -hmm. so you can call the office, and they will give you the information relative to some of these facilities. Uh, and it's really, a, it's very helpful. It's and very it helpful. It's a very useful program. Um, many of the seniors in the 
in the skilled nursing facility don't have the advocate. So the ombudsman program also right. provides that gap. Many of the families are living so far away. There are things are not happening just the way we would anticipate. So that program also bridges that gap. Right, and the, just a quick last thing. Um, if you're out there and looking for a skilled nursing facility, uh, obviously a visit to the facility is important. Correct. And the Department of Public Health does an evaluation, a survey, survey each year, mm -hmm. and they'll, that's where the STAR system comes in. Correct. And if you're looking at you know, whether a loved one or mm -hmm. somebody to go into these facilities, you want to read the evaluations because usually they're at the nurse's station and they're in a binder and it'll tell you exactly right. what happened on their survey. They're usually in there for three to five days, right. so it's pretty intensive. So it's it's probably a good idea to read that, and then they'll, they'll translate into the number of stars that that facility has. It's a five-star system. Correct. Right. And also, uh, Medicare website have a s skilled yeah. nursing checklist for patients, the consumers. So we have that available at the hospital, too. I will be happy to, if anybody ever wants it, but it has a checklist. So if you make a tour to a skilled nursing facility, what should you, you know, do you, should you get very impressed with the chandelier or should you s ask some other question? There's, there's a whole list of things that Medicare has published. Yeah. So it's, it's very important to be the informed consumer. Uh, Ms. Shaw, thank you. I think this was a really, really, we're going to have more questions from the dais, and then we, once um, we're done with the broadcast, we will invite the members of our audience, if you can stay around for a few sure. more minutes. Okay. But I do, I do have another question. I had the, um, I was in the hospital recently for, for a procedure, and you know, the last time I had been a host in a hospital was having my, my last baby, which was 30 years ago, so I had never heard of a hospital list. Right. This is real, and um, when, yeah. when this doctor came in, it wasn't my surgeon, it wasn't a nurse, I, so I, I, I would say, who are you, right. and, and what do you do, and what, what's the deal here? And so I think that the, um, and then he explained the whole thing to me and right. was very, very instrumental in going over my case and issues and he, he was the one to discharge right. me. Correct. But it's, it's a new profession and it's something that I think, you know, we all need to be aware of so right. that, you know, you're not stupid like me and say, oh, who are you? <laughs> so, right. so it's very uh, important. And hospitals mm -hmm. don't have the private practice in the community, most of them. So they are just dedicated to the hospital coverage. And they also have their partners and it's a 24 seven coverage. And it's, they're part of the hospital team. So it's, it's, it's really successful. And I, so I really appreciate your, your bringing us um, that and the rest of the information today. Thank sure. you. Thank you. We have other, thank you. Go ahead. Um, when Los Robles is planning to discharge a patient to a skilled nursing facility, what are the factors that uh, you think are most important in determining which skilled nursing facility the patient goes to? First of all, the patient has the choice, so we have a full list of the choice. Uh, depending on the condition, if the rehab is just the focus, most of the area skilled nursing facility have dedicated rehab staff. Um, we also like to educate our patients on their choice in terms of the distance, right? So if, um, uh, if there is a skilled nursing in town, Wonderful if that's your choice, but if there is a skilled nursing facility that has such certain programs, their star rating is higher, perhaps, and you want to go further down. This, you know, that's what we work with. There are times when the physicians also, who's taking care of you in the hospital, also makes the rounds in the skilled nursing facility. Sometimes that becomes a determining factor as well. It should not hinder the choice, though, because every skilled nursing facility have dedicated doctors that they can assign. So uh, in terms of, um, to answer your question, uh, it's a patient choice. If there are certain programs that, if we have a patient that requires certain equipments, certain IV antibiotic, certain wound care equipments, then some of the skilled nursing facility ha have those capability and some don't. And we have collected a full list of 
those capabilities too and sometimes it's insurance driven as well but a lot of the skilled nursing facility have started offering free uber ride to the spouses because that is uh, that's the one thing that uh, has really helped so if there was a skilled nursing facility you think it's five star and but not in this area and my my spouse doesn't want to drive up the grid or whatever then some of the skilled nursing facilities have that once a day round trip uber drive not all so ask that question to the case management that is that option available and with when I work very closely with them, I try to encourage them to kind of make that available, considering the elderly spouses who wants to visit their their uh, loved ones. Commission, yes, thank you. Let's let's start over here, please, um, Commissioner Pasta. Uh, when you were talking about discharging from the hospital, uh, you mentioned cost efficient as one of the factors. How strong a factor is that? Because I've heard so many stories where people said, I wasn't ready to leave and they made me get out because they want to save money. You know, How that, big a factor is that as opposed to a doctor saying, no, he should stay here? So always the first decision is the doctor, right? So when we say cost effective, it's a next care setting, not the hospital stay. So um, if the needs are met safely in a skilled nursing facility or home home with home health, right? The patient needs intermittent care, not 24-hour supervision, which the skilled nursing and acute rehab offers. But if somebody just needs the rehab, that can be done in the house. So that's the cost, at least cost-effective care setting. In the hospital, usually it's the medical decision. So based on the lab values, based on the need of the patient, that's that decision is made. So there are times it does happen that we end up having patients for a relatively longer time. It might not be cost effective, but it's the right thing to do. And we have different physicians. A, lab, a physician might be waiting for a lab report, right? And another physician clears a discharge. But everybody has to be on the same page to make it a safe discharge. I have these terrible stories. I have a nephew who, uh, he's a bone cancer specialist mm -hmm. up at uh, USF up north, <clears throat> and he said he's constantly arguing with insurance companies that this patient should stay, in my opinion, my expert opinion, mm -hmm. another five days or something. And they say, oh no, he's plenty. We have the book here. Some clerk is telling him how to, what's best for the patient. And he's told me innumerable stories of how he argues with the insurance companies, insur and it's all about money, and it's got the smell of death panels to and, it, and you know? I totally agree with you. And it's, you know, when, when a family is going through that illness, it's very devastating to go through that another hassle. A, um, a lot of the commercial insurance have strict guidelines. They do the utilization review at the back end. There are also tools that are used by hospitals and insurance companies that you plug in the lab value and plug in uh, their all the different medical information and then it kind of guides you whether this discharge is ready or not. I mean, because it's all evidence based, right? It's all in the number at the end of the day. So the da it Again, engaging the physician and engaging all the providers and coordinating that care. And then if the patient's going into the next care setting, ensuring that the me uh, cares are met at the next level. That's the crucial step. So if a doctor, doctor doesn't, sometimes physicians don't have the confidence in the next level of care, right? So then engaging them, educating them that, okay, what are your goals of care? Can this be done at a different level or not? And then everybody has to come on the same page. So that's, that's the engagement that we talk about. Yeah, last question is, is what happens if you refuse to leave the hospital? S there is a appeal process, yes. There is an appeal process that uh, a discharge can be appealed. The, it goes through certain motion, right? And if the op appeal is denied, then the cost of those stay is the, the ch bill comes to the individual. Okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Okay, we have one last question with uh, Commissioner Hakey, please. Sure. Yeah, I have the, um, I belong to Kaiser, the, the uh, senior advantage. Mm -hmm. 
I've, thanks be to God, I've never had to call 911, but when you mentioned that, I, th I started thinking about, well, if I call 911, are the, w what happens to that ambulance? Does that ambulance take you to the closest, which would be Las Robles, Correct. or do they take you where you want them to say, if I say, you got to take me to Kaiser? It depends, first of all, on the condition, right? So the paramedics' decision making process and we have done some community education where I have pulled the paramedics and they bring you know their PowerPoint and that I think there might be something worth at some point uh, educating the community on that what does it how does that dispatching work right so if a Kaiser patient cannot lose time we receive them at Los Robles Hospital. We do whatever we need to do stabilize them we work with Kaiser Transfer Center and then we try when they're stable we transfer them so it all it's all about safety and the right care so it's not that you will be shipped to woodland hills although 101 might take an hour <laughs> <laughs> that's it's usually no we, we do receive kaiser patients at the hospital and we work with them Okay, well, this concludes our speakers section for this meeting and I am very, very grateful that you spent uh, time with us today, brought us really excellent information. Let's give a round of applause, please. Thank, Thank you me. very much. Thank you. Okay, I would just like to remind everyone that our next meeting is going to be our next um, uh, meeting with a major speaker is going to be Wednesday, April 4th, 1 o'clock, here at the Thousand Oaks Civic Arts Plaza. Our guest speaker on that day will be Dr. Sonder, who is a geriatrician at UCLA, who will be talking to us about health care and important screenings for older adults. You're not going to want to miss that. You can watch it on your computer on TOTV, or you can watch it on cable on TOTV, or on the big screen at Gobel, or why don't you bring a friend? over here to the Thousand Oaks Civic Arts Plaza. Make an afternoon of it. Have lunch somewhere close <laughs> by and join us for the meeting. And then finally, I would just like to thank all the commissioners. We gave you a lot of really important information today. That's our job, and I thank everyone for putting the, it takes research. It doesn't happen by itself. It takes research. It takes time to put the um, the PowerPoints together. And uh, sincere thanks to everyone. We we so much appreciate your time and thank you for obtaining our speaker, and um, you know and to Commissioner Maria for running the um, Senior of the Year project. We we do this because we love this and it's important um, and we bring this information to you. So with that, I will adjourn the meeting until next time. Thank you.